This week on VA News, we have these stories and more. Acting Secretary Gibson continues to develop efforts to reduce veteran waiting time. The original GI Bill is 70, and while the post-9-11 GI Bill is only two years old, it's thriving. And this Army veteran survived five tours in Iraq and Afghanistan to live a dream working on NASCAR's many pit roads. Hello, I'm Genevieve Billia with the Office of Public Affairs. And I'm Jerome Mapp with the Office of Strategic Integration. This, this is, is VA, VA News. News. Acting Secretary of Veterans Affairs Sloan Gibson continues to visit VA employees at different facilities each week and to put in place practices he hopes will reduce veterans' wait times. At the Baltimore and Washington, D.C. VA medical centers, Acting Secretary Gibson directed all VA health care directors to conduct monthly in-person reviews of scheduling practices in every facility within their jurisdiction. He also ordered directors of the Veterans Integrated Service Networks to do the same in at least one medical center within their area of responsibility every 30 days, completing visits to all medical centers in their network every 90 days. The department also began pre-solicitation meetings with vendors to discuss the upcoming acquisition of a new medical appointment scheduling system. In far too many instances, we have veterans waiting too long for care. We also have, in too many instances, uh, examples of uh, behavior that's not aligned with our values, uh, behavior that uh, reflects a breach of, of uh, integrity. Um, and as I've said on a number of occasions before, uh, I will use every bit of authority I have at my disposal to hold people accountable who have committed acts of willful misconduct or managers that are uh, responsible for serious management negligence. On June 23rd, VA hosted a roundtable discussion and press conference to mark the 70th anniversary of the original GI Bill. President Franklin Roosevelt signed the Hallmark legislation on June 22, 1944, to ensure 16 million returning veterans of World War II would have the chance to build new lives. In fact, the bill changed the U.S. in the world forever, as more than 8 million veterans got college educations and became doctors, lawyers, architects, and contractors who thrived in the post-war economic boom. Discussions centered around hope that the post-9-11 GI Bill, enacted almost two years ago, will provide successes for veterans of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. In 1944, we could only dream of the immense impact the original GI Bill would have on the landscape of higher education, American culture, and our economy. 31 years after its impl implementation, John Paul Stevens, a World War II veteran and recipient of the GI Bill, was sworn in as the Justice of the United States Supreme Court. In 1983, uh, astronaut Story Musgrave, a Marine Corps veteran and recipient of GI Bill funds, embarked on his first of six flights to space. All in all, the original GI Bill brought us 14 Nobel laureates, two dozen Pulitzer, uh, Pulitzer Prize winners, three Supreme Court justices, and scores of other leaders. Our nation reaped the benefits of this bill. It was an investment not just in veterans, but in our legacy. Over the last 70 years, the GI Bill has served as a tool to reshape our nation, allowing our brightest, most dedicated citizens to better themselves and our country through higher education. Today's post 9-11 GI Bill is also making a difference for veterans in terms of the quality of their lives, their economic security, and personal achievement. The concept is simple, equitable, and just. Those who shouldered our defense in the longest war in our history should have the same opportunity for a first class education as those who served during World War II. Uh, to all of our veterans out there, to all of our student veterans out there, thank you for all you have done. Uh, thank you for uh, what you will do in the future in ways that you have not yet imagined to make a difference for our country. What does an Army squadron on the field of battle in Afghanistan have in common with a NASCAR pit crew? To get a definitive answer, VA News went to the Charlotte Motor Speedway and spent a couple of days with Chris Clayton, who has done both, including six tours in Afghanistan. 
I've always had a passion and desire for auto racing. Uh, anything that went fast, I, I love. Uh, my dad and I, whenever I was growing up, uh, we, we would have our father and son time. My dad would give me a choice during summer, well, do you want to go see a baseball game, a football game, or do you want to uh, go to the racetrack? Every time I'd say, all right, let's go to the racetrack. I joined the Army in July 19th, 2007, and um, I served six tours in Afghanistan. I served three tours as a maintenance uh, mechanic, and then my final three uh, deployments, I was a crew chief on Chinook helicopters and uh, was, uh, would fly with them, work on them, uh, and be the door gunner on them. So. I've always been a NASCAR fan, and when I was here, I saw Coach uh, Greg Morin. Uh, he was, he's the head coach of the uh, 4888, and uh, he, he and I ended up talking for a little bit. I told him my uh, desires to be on his team in particular, and he said, well, you know, just continue to have, uh, you know, uh, stay strong, be in shape, and we'll see what we can do for you. And I tried out during the off season uh, between the 2013 and 2014 season. My wife was actually in the car watching the tryout, and so I walked back out there and I, I told her, uh, I, I, I'm in. <laughs> I would not be where I am today without the military. There are a lot of similarities uh, between the racing community and, uh, and aviation in particular, military aviation. Um, the integrity you have to have and all the little things uh, make a big difference in the end. Going over the wall, you have basically a choreographed chaos, very similar to whenever you're overseas and you're going into a, a, a to fly into a hot LZ. I mean, there's so many moving parts and everyone has to do their job, so you're relying on your buddy next to you to do his job so that you can do your job effectively. And whenever something goes wrong, I mean, it's gonna impact everyone. There's a mental battle. Uh, there is the, well, what if I don't make it? What if I can't do this? What if I'm not good enough? Well, never set limits on yourself. You know, the voice that you listen to inside will determine the life you experience. So always talk positive to yourself, and you are good enough, and you can do it. And you're going to bring and elevate yourself to levels that you never thought possible. Um, just always try to surround yourself with the positive people and you know the things that you can achieve you'll, you'll be very surprised at yourself but. marine corporal kyle carpenter recently became the eighth survivor of the wars in iraq and afghanistan to receive the medal of honor president obama presented the nation's greatest award for courage and valor to carpenter in a white house ceremony on june 19th in a 2010 attack in Afghanistan, Carpenter lost his right eye. Most of his teeth and his jaw and arm were shattered when he jumped in between a live grenade and his fellow Marine and friend, Corporal Nick Euphrasio. If any American seeks a model of the strength and resilience that define us as a people, including uh, this uh, newest 9-11 generation, I want you to consider Kyle. After everything he's been through, he skis, he snowboards, he's jumped from a plane with a parachute, thankfully. <laughs> he trudged through a six-mile mud run, completed the Marine Corps Marathon, says he wants to do a triathlon. Uh, he's a motivational speaker, uh, an advocate for his fellow wounded warriors. Uh, he's thinking about majoring in psychology so he can use his own experiences to help others. He got stellar grades. And by the way, he's only 24 years old and says, I'm just getting started. Um, 
In other words, Kyle is a shining example of what our nation needs to encourage, his veterans who come home and then use their incredible skills and talents to keep our country strong. And we can all learn from Kyle's example. Corporal William Kyle Carpenter should not be alive today, but the fact that he is gives us reason to trust that there is indeed a bigger plan. Tom Carpenter is a tough Navy veteran, now serving the unique members of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community in the U.S. Armed Forces. In conjunction with LGBT Pride Month in June, KCET and Union Bank in Los Angeles recently named Carpenter as one of their local heroes, a program established to highlight those who give back to their communities. Here is KCET's video introducing Tom Carpenter. <laughs> My name is Tom Carpenter. I'm the former co-chair of Service Members Legal Defense Network, and I'm the present co-chair of the Forum on the Military Chaplaincy. I served in the United States Marines on active duty from 1970 to 1976. I flew the A-4 Skyhawk. OutServe SLDN is an organization which provides support for active duty LGBT service members and their families. A lot of people think that now that we've accomplished Don't Ask, Don't Tell, that SLDN should just vanish. But the fact of the matter is there's still more to be done. The benefits that are given to straight couples are not afforded military same-gender couples that are married. We're fighting to make sure that everybody has a right to those same benefits. I'm 100% out of my ship. Coming out is the most important thing you can ever do, and it's so true. Most other folks realize they're not a threat to them or their families. It becomes human. And when it becomes human, that prejudice goes away. Did you know? A little known national cemetery tucked away next to Interstate 95, where US Highway 1 runs underneath it at the south end of Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia, is the forerunner of Arlington National Cemetery and the National Cemetery Administration. While neither as large nor as famous as its nearby neighbor in Arlington, the Alexandria National Cemetery is the final resting place for nearly 3,600 federal soldiers, black and white. It is also the final resting place for the four men who died while in pursuit of Abraham Lincoln's assassin, John Wilkes Booth. On July 7, 1922, this granite boulder with an attached bronze tablet was placed in the cemetery in memorial of these men. Located in sections B and C of this historic cemetery are the headstones of hundreds of U.S. colored troops. Alexandria National Cemetery was the first to bury U.S. colored troops. In its series of lessons in the 150-year sesquicentennial celebration of the Civil War, the National Cemetery Administration took a group of history buffs and officials to the Alexandria National Cemetery on June 19. During the tour, workers continued the restoration of the original Superintendent's Lodge, which was destroyed by fire in 1878 and restored in 1887. The day following the cemetery tour, Under Secretary for Memorial Affairs Steve Murrow ended an impeccable VA career of more than 40 years, all with the National Cemetery Administration. Murrow rose through the ranks from truck mechanic to cemetery director to the front office and to the undersecretary position. Many of his former and current colleagues attended a retirement celebration at VA Central Office. Before we go, remember that the 4th of July is upon us. Celebrate our great nation and the many freedoms we enjoy thanks to millions of patriots through the ages. If you can't get out to celebrate, watch the Capitol 4th on your local PBS station. Happy birthday, America! That's all we have this week. Thank you for watching. I'm Genevieve Billia. And I'm Jerome Mapp. Have a really nice day and rest of your week.